Okay. Okay, practice back to primary and secondary qualities. <laughs> um, so, um, right, so I was trying to explain at the end last time is like, in what sense does Locke think the primary qualities are really in bodies? So, I mean, because actually both primary and secondary qualities are in external objects. Um, right, like again, you know, here's my mind, here's my perception, my act of perception, here's the idea, here's the body that I'm perceiving. So the body that I'm perceiving uh, has a power to cause me to carry out this perception. And that power is what's called the quality. So the quality actually is in the body. Right, this is how he defines quality uh, in book to chapter page the scribbling is all of it. Two chapter and then maybe I won't find it again. Anyway, when he defines quality, yeah, okay. Book two, uh, chapter eight, section eight. What, whatsoever the mind perceives in itself or is the immediate object of perception, thought, or understanding, that I call idea. And the power to produce any idea in our mind, I call quality of the subject wherein that power is, right? So this body is the subject wherein this power is. This power is the power to cause us to perceive immediately the idea. And then by way of the idea, we perceive the quality in the, in the thing the quality is in. So, um, So these primary qualities and secondary qualities are both in bodies. What's the difference between them? So I think Locke says two things about the difference between primary versus secondary qualities. He says primary qualities are real powers while secondary qualities are bare powers. And he says primary qualities resemble their ideas and secondary qualities don't resemble, etc. All right. Um, and what I'm so, um, so I spent a long time last time trying to explain what the difference in real powers and bare powers is, right? Again, it, a real power is supposed to be a power something has by virtue of a thing that is that power, whereas about bare power is a power that something has just by being what it is, and there's no separate thing that is the power. So he's saying the primary qualities, when he says the primary quality is a real power in the subject wherein it is, that is in the body that has it, he means that um, something like, there actually is something corresponding to that 
power. So we can separate in some way from the other things in the body. Um, and what about this? And this is what I was trying to explain at the end last time. And I first pointed out that it seems like you couldn't even ask whether ideas resemble something in an external object. Right? Because um, to compare the idea to the quality in the object, I would have to perceive the quality in the object to see what it's like. And but the only way I can do that is through the idea. So there's no like getting around the idea to do this comparison. Um, but then what I was suggesting was that resemble here could be understood in a technical way. What's going on here? Weird thing happening on the screen. Um, I think my book was doing things. <laughs> um, so, um, right, what I was suggesting is that resemble can be understood uh, in a technical way. And I was saying that a resemblance, like a technical sense of resemblance is analogy, right? So analogy means equality of ratios. A is to B as C is to D. Um, and I guess, I mean, you could say that this is kind of a simple version of what we more generally would call isomorphism, right? Sameness of structure. Um, so, um, and then I tried to explain what set, what the sense of resemblance here is by saying, by reading that passage from book four. So, right, book four, chapter three, section 14. Some few of the primary qualities have a necessary dependence and visible connection one with another. So there, I think he's using primary qualities to mean the ideas of the primary qualities, right? They, I mean, although it's going to turn out maybe that's the whole point, but it doesn't make a difference which one you're talking about. But I think there he means the ideas of the primary qualities have a necessary connection one with another. And if, if you look there in context, you'll see that he's talking about whether our simple ideas have necessary connections, right? So some few of the primary qualities have visible necessary connections one with another. So like in a simple case, you could say, whenever I have this one, I also have this one. I mean, it's never that simple, I guess, but I mean, it comes close what he says about solidity, right? Whenever I have the feeling of solidity, I also have the idea of my hands not being able to approach each other. Um, that is the idea of, of resistance, of one body not allowing another one into its space. Um, so there's these visible necessary connections. And then I was saying, so these two ideas right here's my perception of these two ideas. The perceptions were caused by faculties in the body. Qualities. And now, because these necessarily go together, their causes must necessarily go together. Right, so the analogy is, this is to this as this is to this. Right? This quality is to this quality as this idea is to this idea, namely that they, they on both sides we have necessarily going together. 
And so notice, like, we no longer have to be able to say what this is, other than it's a cause of perception of this idea. You don't have to be able to get around and see what it is. Whatever it is, it has to necessarily go with that. If these necessarily go with each other. Um, so, um, so in what sense does that mean that these are real qualities? Well, um, I think, you know, um, one reason I was struggling to explain what a real power or real quality is, is that, um, uh, it's hard to figure out where these things are supposed to be. <laughs> Right? Like, if you say uh, whiteness is a thing and the snowball is something else, is another thing, how are those two things related to each other? Right? There's certainly not, it's certainly not a spatial part of the snowball that you could take out. Um, so, um, like, trying to understand what it means that there are real qualities or real powers or that there's a separate thing about the subject that constitutes that power. I think um, it has to mean something like whatever the this object is, it has a certain structure. It's not a spatial structure, right? It's a structure of necessary relations. It has some kind of structure. Um, that's what enables me to start like counting its qualities. Whereas, so like, let's go back to the snowball example. Uh, what can I erase here? Let's not erase this. All right. So the snowball, like, So when I perceive the snowball, among other things, I perceive it as having a certain radius and a certain what's the center. Having a certain radius and a certain circumference. And I think um, the, so uh, I know that if the radius is one, then the circumference has to be two pi. How do I know that? So this is a case where Locke is going to say there's a visible necessary connection. Um, and you know, this is part of the reason I said Locke is not the most radical empiricist. I mean, Locke thinks we got the idea of radius and the idea of circumference from experience. So we weren't born with those, those ideas. And therefore, we certainly weren't bo born knowing what the relationship between the radius and the circumference is. Right? So like infants don't know that the circumference is 2 pi times the radius. That seems plausible, right? And moreover, it seems like it's Locke's reason that they don't even know what circumference and radius are, or or pi or two or any of those things, right? Is like that's that seems like a good argument for why infants don't know that. Yeah, they could. They don't even have the right ideas yet. But Locke thinks once you do have those ideas, you can see the necessary relationship between. So even though the the ideas came from experience and the the proposition is not innate, you don't know the proposition from experience. You don't know it based on experience. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is there a question about this? No, you don't understand what I'm saying, or no, there's no question. <laughs> it's a yeah. question. Yeah. Also under the impression that secondary uh, qualities they're made in the mind in a sense that uses like other species from some distant out of galaxy, maybe have perceptions that are completely different to us, or maybe 
their evol evolutionary uh, rationale didn't lead them to spot the, the color red. So they don't see the color red when we'd be seeing the color red. So it's a secondary quality to that piece. That's kind of how I try to rationalize it, but I'm not sure if that's. Well, um, I mean, how do we know that? How, how do we know that red is like that and circumference is not? <laughs> I mean, it's. I think it's. It's because circumference is a real power in the body, and the idea of circumference resembles circumference. <laughs> Um, therefore, if those other beings, I mean, of course, they might just like infants not have these ideas at all. But if they have, they're going to see the same necessary connection we do. Because the ideas themselves are necessarily connected. That's how we, so, right, what I'm, ask, what I'm asking here is, like, how do we know where to draw that line? I think you're, you're right that that's one of the implications of it. That secondary qualities are going to be, they're going to differ not only between us and aliens in another galaxy, but between different human beings right here, right? Some people are colorblind, you know, right? So they're like, they're going to be different. And the claim is that, again, if you have the primary qualities at all, and if you have the sense of touch, then you have the ideas of primary quality. As, again, as someone was pointing out last time, the sense of touch is the, is the sense that you have because you yourself are a body interacting with other bodies. Um, so uh, if you have those ideas at all, then um, they're going to be the same. They're going to resemble each other. Right? Even if this alien has a different sensation that it calls solidity. It's going to have to have the same necessary connection if, I, if, it, if it's an effect of this power. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the name of this study, so <laughs> maybe I'm wrong, you know. Okay. But um, they did this uh, study that showed that the development of words for different colors is pretty much universal. Like the words are developed in the same order across cultures. I think it's like first red because blood is immediately something you need to identify, and then it's green or yellow. Right. The explanation is not so certain, right? And no, the, it's yeah. not certain at all. <laughs> yeah. But and then like green or yellow, and then blue. You know, I forget the exact order. Yeah, there is something like that, or you know, so, or you know, languages. Uh, like some languages have more color terms and some have fewer color terms. And the one they're most likely to have after black and white is red. Yes. And yeah. But I, I guess what I'm asking is like, what makes color or sight so much more unreliable than touch? Like the distinction to me doesn't make, I don't know, it doesn't seem to make that much sense. Well, um, so first of all, that study, I mean, in other words, um, since all the things you're studying are human beings and they all have the same shape and they all have the same kind of eyes and whatever, it's not surprising that there's some similarities between them. Mm. Uh, that's, you know, I mean, I don't think that's that's so relevant here. I, you know, yeah. I mean, like, again, like, unless you found a language where everyone who spoke it was colorblind, then you would expect to get different results. Certainly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but presumably there are no languages like that. But, you know, or like if parrots had a, of their own language, with their own color words, you know, et cetera. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but, but if the question is, um, like, how do we know that our agreement that the, that the circumference is two pi times the radius is not like that? Yeah. That, right. Like, 
Um, and again, Locke's answer, and it's so it's an answer that Hume is going to say is absurd, and Kant is going to agree is absurd, mm -hmm. and then Kant is going to try to give a much more complicated answer. And that's what I was actually just talking about before I rushed over here and tried to set up my camera. It was Kant's attempt to answer this question. But Locke's answer is because we see a necessary connection. <laughs> okay. Right, so whereas, whereas at least supposedly we don't see any necessary connection between red and other ideas. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, there's some questions about that. Like, don't we know that red has to be extended? But, um, but yeah, but so some people, let's see. I was talking about where was the point where I stopped and asked if people understood it? And people were saying, no, I don't understand. Because <laughs> I need to get back to that, obviously. You're talking about the, um, the circumference. Yeah, and I was saying that according to Locke, um, oh, I remember, it was when I was talking about how Locke is not such a strict empiricist, right? That Because again, so if like this proposition, uh, circumference equals three pi times the radius, like, um, so Locke says it's not innate. We couldn't have known this when we were born because we didn't know what circumference was and what equality was and what two is and what pi is and what radius is. So we obviously didn't know this. Right, that is, we didn't even have the ideas that this proposition is made of, so we couldn't know the proposition. And as far as he's concerned, therefore, he's dealt with the alternative to empiricism, which is innate principles. Right, he said this is not an innate principle, but he's not saying that we learned it's true from experience, like that it could have turned out otherwise or something like. That. On the contrary, he's saying that as soon as we had all these ideas and put them together in this way, then we could know without any further experience that this relation was true because there's a visible necessary connection. Right, so this is an example of something that Kant would call a priori. It's not innate. So, so although Locke is an empiricist, I mean, Kant also thinks there's a priori concepts, which Locke says doesn't think that about ideas, right? So it's not that they don't disagree about something, but as far as this type of proposition goes, they're not actually arguing with each other when Locke says it's not innate and Kant says it's a priori that is not based on experience. So, so Locke, and I mean, this is important because again, Hume is going to say this idea of a visible necessary connection makes no sense. Necessary connection isn't the kind of thing that can be visible, basically. <laughs> right? So that, and therefore, Hume is going to say um, that we must have learned this from experience too, if we know it at all, <laughs> if it's even true. Actually, Hume. And the treatise is, at least is going to say that it's not even true. <laughs> but, um, but we'll get to that later. All right. So, so anyway, so Locke says we perceive this visible necessary connection between what? Well, we perceive it between the I, my idea. I mean, I guess these are not simple ideas. And I'm not even sure how to analyze them into simple ideas, according to Locke. Um, Right. So, but anyway, we have these two ideas, radius and circumference, and we see that they have a necessary relation to each other. And it's more complicated than just whenever you have a radius, you also have a circumference. It's like there's a certain rule to how they go together or whatever. But so, um, but we see there's a necessary relationship between them. And therefore, there's a necessary relationship between so now, like, it's misleading to keep drawing the snowball as a circle. 
The circle is a feature of my idea, right? The snowball is something that causes me to perceive, you know, so this is the snowball. <laughs> it has in itself some power by virtue of which it causes me to, well, it's not this way, it causes me to perceive a radius. And it has in it a power by virtue of which it causes me to perceive a circumference. And we know that these ideas that it causes have to be related to each other in a certain way. It's necessary. And therefore, we know that we don't know, we, like, we can't say, except in terms of our, our ideas, what the qualities are in the snowball, right? But we know that there's something in the snowball that has a relationship analogous to something else that, this, that my idea of the circumference has to the idea of the radius. Yeah. He does not argue, he just says, and I mean, of course, like that, like if you claim that something is visible, right, and of course, that's not really, doesn't really mean that we see it, because seeing is immediately perceiving something by way of an idea, right? But it's some kind of metaphor. And when you say that it's visible, you're saying that it doesn't need an explanation. It right? is visible, it's known. It's known just by perceiving it, right? And right, that is, it's known immediately, not as the result of an inference. And if you ask for a proof of it, and we'll see when Locke talks about proof later, when you, if you ask for a proof of it, you show that you don't understand what, you know, what you're asking for, right? Because you can't ask for a proof of something that you already know, <laughs> according to Locke. I mean, mathematicians spend a ton of time looking for proofs of things that they already know. So Locke, must be missing something about what proofs are for. But anyway, I'll talk about that much later when we get to this discussion of proof. All right. Um, right, so as opposed to the qualities of whiteness and coldness that are in the snowball, um, like the, the property of whiteness tells me that the snowball somehow is able to cause me, cause me to perceive the, the idea of whiteness. The property of coldness tells me that somehow the snowball is able to cause uh, me to perceive the idea of coldness. But I don't learn anything about how those qualities are related to each other. Are they the same thing? Are they two different things? Do they always go together? Do they sometimes come apart? Like the perception doesn't, I, I mean, that is, the perception doesn't tell me the one because it doesn't tell me the other. Because it doesn't show me any relationship between those ideas, I can't learn any relationship between the qualities. And there's no other way. Again, like this is the thing about how I can't go around behind without the idea and inspect the qualities, right? All I know about the qualities is the power to cause these ideas. And if, I, and if like, if all I know is there's two simple ideas and they're not the same, that doesn't tell me anything about the qualities that cause them. So that's the sense in which these qualities are bare powers. They're not a part of the structure of the object. And that's also why that is if these were sorry, if these were secondary qualities, if this wasn't there, these would be bare powers. Meaning, like. I can, so to speak, count the powers, right? I can say it has this power and it has this power, but I don't know that that counting corresponds to going from one thing to another in the object in any way. And so, um, and so that is, they're bare powers because um, they don't resemble their ideas. <laughs> Or they don't resemble ideas because they're bare power. Anyway, the two things go together. 
Yeah. Do they not resemble their ideas because the mind receives them in a way that alters them? Well, I mean, so the mind never literally receives the power of the of the external object, right? Like if the mind, like if this is the snowball's quality of whiteness, if the mind received that quality, that would mean that the mind becomes white. It starts looking white, <laughs> right? Because that this this quality is the power to look white. So it obviously doesn't get literally received into the mind, right? The, the mind, as far as we know, isn't even a body at all and can't be white. Again, Locke says he's not going to try to settle that in this book. But from the fact that he's not going to try to settle that, you can tell that he doesn't think that we need to know that. It's right. So that's why I said, as far as we know, the mind isn't a body at all and it can't be white. It's not extended. Right. So this quality can't literally be received. What, what we receive is the idea that represents this quality. And this idea is always something different from that quality, right? So it's always, so to speak, changed in, in being received. But it's, I mean, it's a, it's a misleading way to think about it because it's not the same thing at all. It's not like this got changed. It's a, this is a power of looking white. And this is an immediate object of perception in my mind. And they're, they're not the same thing. And, you know, and, but, and again, that's why, uh, or maybe this is a different way of seeing why it's, it seems ridiculous to ask whether these things resemble each other. Right? Like, if this resembled this, then again, that, you know, that seems to me, well, okay, it's not exactly the same, but it resembles it. So my mind turns kind of whitish. <laughs> like, it turns kind of gray or something, you know. But that's not like... <laughs> Right, it's not like when you, I mean, of course, there was this ancient doctrine that like perceives like, right? That like, is it Anaxagoras? Who said that the soul has to be composed of all elements mixed together because it has to be able to perceive all of them. Right, but, um, but that theory doesn't really work very well. <laughs> it didn't work out very well for Anaxagoras, I don't think. And yeah, so, I mean, anyway, that's clearly, that's not Locke's theory, right? He doesn't think that when you perceive white, your mind becomes white. And when you perceive a uh, circle, your mind becomes round, and, right? So, um, uh, so, but that just pushes the question again. So what do you even ask when you ask if these ideas resemble the problems? They can't be the same in this book. What are you asking? And again, my claim is you're asking whether there's an analogy between whether there's an identity of structure between the ideas and the corresponding qualities. And in the case of secondary qualities, there is that. And that's just, that's all that you mean by saying they don't resemble their qualities. Um, and I mean, Locke can't explain why, right? Like Kant thinks he can explain why. Locke can't explain why some qualities, why some ideas are ideas of primary qualities and other uh, ideas are ideas of secondary qualities. Again, it's just, we have to see it. <laughs> we find that certain simple ideas have visible necessary connections. But I mean, it's not a coincidence that those very ideas tend to turn out to be the ideas of the essential properties of bodies. They turn out to be the ideas of the simple, essential, essential properties of bodies because these are the ideas that we can use to represent the structure of an external object. So what an external object will be, it will be the thing that can be represented in terms of these ideas.
You don't seem happy by this answer. <laughs> I'm sorry. I did. I sent this class start. I get more questions from the other class than going in. I thought I like, understood the reading and I'm just like getting my world completely world start. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's true. Part of what I'm trying to do is make the reading seem less easy to understand because I, you know, I think like it's easy. So it's it's easy first to read that passage and say, oh yeah, you know, uh, the idea of light doesn't resemble anything in the snowball, but the idea, okay, fine, whatever. And then the second step would be to say, wait, hold on a second. That doesn't make any sense. And then the step after that might be, so this lock guy is actually kind of stupid. And I try to head that off by saying, no, that's not what it means. It's like, that's a, that, that rather than that being a signal that this lock guy is kind of stupid, it's a signal that the passage is harder to understand than you thought. It's not a simple question. What does it mean for ideas to resemble the qualities that cause them? You have to think about it. And then if you think about it enough, um, uh, just enough not to see all the objections to what I'm saying, <laughs> then uh, things will start making sense again. Yeah. So is, is there a way that a, a, a primary qualities idea in a world of ideas behaves the same way as the quality of world qualities behaves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if world is the right word for it. For what we're talking because, about here, but you're defining it by relationships to other ideas or other yeah, things. yeah. So like in idea space, yeah. If, if, if like if we were, it had the same relationships as the quality it has in quality space. Yeah, I mean, of course, like that generalization of space is like 19th century here, you know, right? So like, but um, but yeah, I mean, that's the way we can think about. It. In quality space, the qualities in 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 in, in and you think of quality space, the relationship of qualities in quality space being necessary connection, right? And that relationship with ideas in idea space is also necessary connection, and that's why that's how you can get right. So, like the isomorphism is a map from idea space to quality space that preserves that necessary connection, right? Right, and that's the resemblance. Uh -huh. Um, okay, and you know, so like, I have to get on to talk about actually not even to talk about the new reading yet because I also have to talk about abstraction that I didn't get to at all last time. <laughs> so I, there's a lot more that could be said about this, but I'll just say, look, so like, I think, you know, it's so it's because of this that law. Uh, thinks we know certain things about bodies, like, um, that every body is, is, is divisible. Um, that is that, um, the vision of a body always yields more bodies. I think is one way of putting it. So when you destroy an extended thing by dividing it, you always get two other extended things. Or in other words, solidity is not a property that can be destroyed by division. How do we know that? Because other properties can be destroyed by division, right? Like he has gives this example of grinding up almonds and the color changes and the taste changes. Right? But he's saying, we know, even though the parts that are left may be too small for us to feel. And I think touch is the, is the, is the important sense here, right? Even though it's like we always, and I do this too, and Locke does this too, always tend to switch to vision. That is, we seeing people always tend to switch to vision. But really, it's, really, we should be talking about touch here. Right, because touch is the sense where you perceive solidity. I'm saying that, you know, like, even when these things are too small for us to, to, to get the sensation of solidity from them anymore, we know it's still there. 
And we know it's still there because of these type of necessary connections. All right. Um, okay, are there more questions about that before I talk about abstraction? Abstraction is, I mean, this is this is a primary secondary distinction is super important, and so is abstraction. Yeah. I don't remember exactly, but shouldn't it also be mentioned too that our senses are confirmed by other people in the sense that I've had dreams where I feel pain and pleasure, et cetera. I touch things, I feel, I feel it. In that sense, uh, it's not real, it's confirmed only when I'm like, okay, I see another person. So, yeah. Um, Right. Um, yeah, how do I know the difference between dream and me? So, I mean, we'll see Locke talking about that um, later on, but uh, to say that other people confirm it, I mean, you can also dream that other people confirm it. Yeah. So, <laughs> But uh, um, so the question is so in this way of understanding where the primary quality, what the uh, sorry secondary qualities are. Um, as I was saying, you're like you're not really mistaken in a dream when you think there's something white. There is something that looks white under those conditions. Did, did I already mention this example from Bertrand Russell? Bertrand Russell in a paper called The Relation of Sense Data to Physics says um, that a sea battle is the way a slamming door appears through the medium of a sleeping brain. Right? Meaning, so he's imagining that you're sleeping and all of a sudden in your dream, there's a sea battle, which is really loud, apparently, because they always use those examples of something loud. So, um, there's a sea battle in your dream. And why are you dreaming that? Because someone just slammed the door. Right? And so uh, Bertrand Russell says, like, in effect, you are hearing the door. It just, and you are seeing the door, I guess. It just, through the medium of a sleeping brain looks like a sea battle, <laughs> right? So it's just like, you know, if I was looking at a white piece of paper through a red um, piece of glass, there is something red, or at least there's something that looks red under those conditions. Um, so, but primary qualities, it seems like people have to say that you really are deceived because there aren't the right necessary connections or something. And I don't know, like that is going to cause a problem here, I think, but I'm not sure what else to say about it. All right. So it's a good question, but I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> okay. Any other questions before I talk about abstraction? So abstraction is... I guess after perception is the most important uh, operation of the mind in Locke. And I mean, it's most important to Locke because it's his explanation of how uh, reasoning and language and all this stuff is possible because we have this faculty of abstraction and he says it's what divides men from the brutes or the, the beasts, right? The beasts abstract not. Um, um, it's also important from the point of view of this course because it's one of the two things that Barclay is going to disagree with Locke about. One thing that Barclay disagrees with Locke about is whether there is an external object. <laughs> Barclay says, no, there's just ideas. But the other thing is, Barclay's going to say, and there's no abstract ideas. Um, Okay, so, but to understand abstraction, I have to say something about the other operations that come before abstraction. 
Now, I mean, of course, they don't come before abstraction in the sense that you do all these things in the first part of your life, and then afterwards you only do abstraction or something like that. But you have to be able to, you have to do these other things first. And um, so, like, there's there's both a kind of um, order of them in human development, and there's also, like, the more fundamental things are the ones are the ones that all animals can do. And then as you get to the higher level ones, some animals can't do it. And then, right. So, um, but to talk about those, Yeah, I have to talk about the difference between perception and memory. So basically, like the first operation after perception is, well, I mean, he says actually the first operation after perception is what he calls contemplation, which means that you, you continue having the same idea for a while after you perceive it. Um, and then the next one is what he calls memory, which means that you stopped having the idea, but now you have the power to have it again. But when you have it again, somehow it's now the idea of, of something that you perceived before. That's what makes it a memory. Um, So I think, I mean, yeah, I think I have to talk about this. I keep thinking, is there some way to put this off? But I don't think there is. All right. So because I want to talk about these weird ideas that Locke says, go along with every other idea. So there's two of them, definitely. Existence. and unity. And there seems to be a third one, which is power. And there may be also is a fourth one, which is limit. If these are the ones he actually says, they go along with every idea, right? So this is book two, chapter seven, section seven on page 131. Um, for some reason, your camera is out of focus. Oh, sometimes that happens. And the only thing to plug it, plug it back in. Mm. Right, then it focuses itself again. There should be a button on it to make it focus again, but there, all right. <laughs> Okay, so existence and unity are two other ideas that are suggested to the understanding by every object without and every idea within. Um, when ideas are in our minds, we consider them as being actually there, as well as we consider things to be actually without us, which is that they exist or have existence. And whatever we can consider as one thing, whether a real being or idea, suggests to the understanding the idea of unity. So, like, there's a whole bunch of puzzles about this, which I can't get into all of. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, like so. So here's the idea of red, and here's the idea of existence. And whenever we get the idea of red, we also get the idea of existence. So, like, I mean, first of all, that means here's the red body. Does that mean besides a quality by virtue of which it causes me to perceive red, it has a quality by virtue of which it causes me to perceive existence? 
Um, I don't think it means that. I mean, in the case of power, which is one reason, I mean, so power, he discusses in the very next section, right? The sentence, section eight, the sentence right after what I just read, power is another of those simple ideas which we receive from sensation and reflection. But he doesn't actually say that it comes in with every idea. But I mean, if you think about it, like think of, so the idea of red is the idea of something that has the power for, to cause me to perceive red, right? This quality is the power to cause me to perceive red. So, um, so it makes sense to say, yeah, whenever I have the idea of red, I have the idea of power. And whenever I have any idea, I have the idea of power because the idea of power is contained in what I represent using an idea, namely the power to cause the idea. And then I think you can see even more clearly why we don't want to say, and moreover, there's another power, the power to cause me to perceive the idea of power. <laughs> right? That would be like an infinite regress or something. <laughs> Right, that like this one, there would have to be another power to cause me to, you know, right? So, um, so I think even though, as I, I said before, that the Locke, so that Locke thinks there are no a priori, priori ideas, in a way, these weird ideas, maybe he does think. I mean, in Kant's terminology, you could describe him as thinking that way. Because again, even though we, you know, we don't have this until we experience things. We're not born with the idea of power or existence or unity. But as soon as we get any idea at all, they come in and they don't come from the object. So in a sense, they're not, even though we need experience to have them, in a sense, they're not derived from experience. All right, I don't want to push that part too hard, but I want to go back to this idea of existence. And like, so somehow this idea of existence, um, okay, so like suppose, let's take something that's like the idea of horse. So, um, so when I say that whenever I have the idea of horse, I also have the idea of existence. That doesn't mean, of course, that whenever I think of a horse, there's a horse. But I think I'm thinking about a horse right now, but there's no horse here. That's <laughs> here. All right. So, um, what does it mean that the idea comes with the idea of existence? Well. Um, there was a horse, right? I mean, uh, this is an empirical concept. I formed it by experiencing horses, or by even if I didn't experience them, someone who did experience them told me about them, or something like that, right? So, like, there was a horse. So it seems like the idea of existence is the idea of existence at a time. In perception, the time is now. <laughs> but in memory, the time is another time. Now you might say, well, what about if instead of the idea of horse, I have the idea of unicorn? So I've never seen a unicorn, and neither has anyone else. Um, but remember, so the mind can make complex ideas, and we're about to talk about how it can do it, but the mind can't make simple ideas. So the idea of unicorn is composed ultimately of simple ideas, right? Perhaps in many layers of, stru of structure, composition and decomposition, as Locke says. 
Decomposition means mixing mixtures. Okay. So it's like an alchemy or pharmacology term. Right. So anyway, um, this uh, the idea of unicorn is ultimately composed of simple ideas. And those simple ideas, um, their objects existed at some time because the mind can't make new simple ideas. Right, so when I represent the unicorn, I'm representing it, you know, the unicorn idea is, so to speak, composed of simple memories. <laughs> yeah. For animals, would their simple ideas be their biological uh, term, or biological derivation, like a horse in the form of an equestrian, or is that still not simple enough? No, we're not going in that direction. In fact, that's the direction of abstraction. That's a whole different rate. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. Anyway, the, you know, like the simple ideas are like white, you know, warm, <laughs> right? So somehow, uh, and existence is a simple idea, and space is a simple idea. But we'll see if I get to that. Um, so um, yeah, somehow by putting simple ideas like that together, we get the idea of a unicorn. Uh, um, there's really a lot of hand waving that has to go with, right? Like, I mean, um, uh, I don't think for almost any idea that Locke can actually list the simple ideas to point, right? But it's but but you can but you can list ideas that it's composed of some. Right? Like it's, it looks like a horse, but it has a horn, and et cetera, et cetera. And then you, and then you can write like by defining, you can say what those are composed of, and then you have, just have to say that can't go on forever. It must stop at simple ideas, <laughs> even though I can't give the list. I think that's the way Locke thinks about it. Um, it's it's out of focus again. No, why is that happening? Why is that? Is it because I'm knocking it somehow? No, it is. Okay. <laughs> this part of the lecture will have a soundtrack. These <laughs> are performances. What? Oh, okay. Um, right. So therefore, memory. Um, so this is the description of memory, book two, chapter. 10, section 2 on page 147. Wow, this book is really falling apart now. Um, but our, our ideas being nothing but actual perceptions in the mind, which cease to be any... See, there's another example of him using an idea in a weird... Right, like he's saying the idea is the perception, our idea being nothing but simple perceptions of the mind. But the idea is the object of the perception. So he's using it in a kind of confused way, which again, he, he says he's going to do. <laughs> um, I mean, I think like maybe we can understand better why it's so tempting to do that because like, Perception space and idea space and quality space are similar to each other. <laughs> like perceiving of the idea in the mind is not governed by the law instead of perceiving a real body. But well, but I mean no, it is because the perceiving of a real body is the perceiving of the idea, right? So um, and if we're perceiving the body, the body is here now. If we're remembering the body, the body was here, but now it's not. 
So actually, when Locke when Locke actually talks about something like a dreaming argument, he he actually rather than talking about how do I know whether it's a perception or an imagination, he asks, how do I know if it's a perception or a memory? Right. So like like the, like what happens in a dream? Maybe it's not at all like Bertrand Russell. Maybe it's more like Freud. <laughs> yeah. The things you're seeing in a dream are actually things you remember. Well, at least the simple ideas they're made up of, not very much like Freud. But anyway, um, okay, but sorry, getting back to this. So, um, right, but our ideas being nothing, but actual perceptions in the mind, which cease to be anything when there is no perception of them, this laying up of our ideas in the repository of memory signifies no more but this, that the mind has a power in many cases to revive perceptions, which it once had, with this additional perception annexed to them that it has had them before, right? So this initial additional perception annexed to them, like what is that a perception of? So that's what I was just trying to explain, right? Like the, this additional perception annexed to them is the idea of existence that goes along with them. Only idea of existence is always the idea of existence at some time. And um, so in the case of a perception, it's the idea of existence now, but in the case of a memory, it's the idea of existence before. That's insofar as it means real existence. And so far as it means the existence of the idea, it's always now, right? So he says, we say the ideas exist within us. That means the idea exists in us now. Well, we, so in other words, what we remember is not an idea, but a, but a thing. Um, Right, and therefore he's going to say much later. This is Book Four, Chapter Eleven, Section Eleven, on page five sixty-two. Um, As when our senses are actually employed about any object, we do know that it does exist. So by our memory, we may be assured that heretofore things that affected our senses have existed. Right, so it's again, it's like, and if you ask, wait a second, what about delusion or whatever, think of a simple idea, like the idea of light. So if I'm actually having it now, there actually is something causing me to perceive the idea of light. Now, I may be wrong about what it is, but there's something because I'm perceiving light, so something caused me to perceive light. Similarly, if I'm remembering light, there actually was something that caused me to perceive light. I might be wrong about what it was, but there was something. And the, the power of memory is the, is the power to retrieve ideas with that assurance. Um, okay, so like then there's uh, a bunch of other operations that that memory makes possible that come after memory and one is discernment that is like um noting the two ideas are different from each other and another is comparing which means like uh seeing the relation between two different ideas. In fact, Locke says that operation is the foundation of all ideas of relation. Um, and then there's compounding, which means putting ideas together to make a more complex idea. And so like basically there's three ways that ideas can go together. One is by the coexistence of their objects. 
right? So like when white and cold go together because I'm both seeing and feeling a snowball, they go together because the object of one is the object of the other. There, um, uh, so, well, I guess maybe that one is kind of obvious, but, but it's only interesting when you contrast with the other two. So the second one is involuntary association, where somehow two ideas have gotten connected in me in such a way that when I have one of them, the other one also comes. So we're going to see that Locke um, connects that with that kind of going together of ideas with madness. <laughs> he says that's what that's what's essential to madness. And then if you say, don't, don't we all do that? He says, well, yeah, we're all mad in certain ways. <laughs> right, so we'll get to that. Um, but finally, the third way they can go together is voluntary association. I decide to put them together. And when I, and when I do that, I attach these ideas of existence and unity. <laughs> right? So this is book two, chapter 12, section two on page 160. Um, uh, actually, it starts on the bottom of page 159. Ideas thus made up of several simple ones put together I call complex, such as beauty, gratitude, a man, an army, the universe, which though complicated of various simple ideas or complex ideas made up of simple ones, yet are, when the mind pleases, considered each by itself as one entire thing and signified by one by one name right so when the when so our mind as it pleases can put ideas together to form a new idea and this is the operation of compounding and when I, when we do that we we now regard we now attach unity to the whole complex idea So I, unity went with the ideas that we're making it up of, but that's not, right? So like, um, you know, whatever is white is one white thing. And whatever is cold is one cold thing. When I put them together to get the idea of something that's white and cold, um, I'm not thinking that it's one white thing, I'm not just thinking that it's one white thing or that it's one cold thing. I'm thinking that it's one thing that's white and cold. So I've supplied a new idea of unity to, um, to put them together into a complex idea. Okay, and finally, after all of this, we get to abstraction. So, I mean, so notice, first of all, like compounding comes before abstraction. We can perform abstraction when we've made complex ideas. And so what do we do when we perform the operation of abstraction? So this is uh, book two, chapter 11, section nine on page 155. The mind makes the particular ideas received from particular objects to become general which is done by considering them as they are in the mind such appearances, separate from all other existences and the circumstances of real existence as time, place, or any other concomitant ideas. So 
So there's different parts of that. But so first of all, considering them as they are in the mind, such appearances um, means that in a sense, it's in abstraction and only in abstraction that the ideas are considered correctly, right? Because they really are different from each other. Or that is, I mean, different simple ideas really are different from each other. Remember, he said that when we sense the snowball, that the um, um, the ideas come into the mind simple and unmixed. So the idea of white and the idea of cold really are completely different from each other. If I consider them precisely and accurately as what they are, I'll, cons I'll be considering them an abstraction from each other. Right, he also says, um, in sentence, well, not, anyway, very soon after the part I read, such precise naked appearances in the mind without considering how, whence, or with what others they came there, the understanding lays up with names commonly annexed to them as the standards to rank real existences into sorts. Right, so this so abstraction is a kind of precision. It's a kind of considering the ideas without other ideas that I usually attach to them, and thereby seeing what they really are. Um, So that sort of explains what this is and sort of not. I mean, it sort of explains what it is. So like, here's one way to think of it. No. Right. So it's sort of like, so here's one way to think about abstraction. You know, like I have the idea of a snowball. So it includes why this isn't a snowball, it's the idea of a snowball. <laughs> So it includes white, round, cold, and a bunch of other ideas. So you might say, well, this is the operation of abstraction. Um, take out some of these ideas. I mean, that's what abstraction means, right? Abst abstraction means taking, taking off, taking away. Right? So, you know take out some of these ideas. So like take out coal, for example. And now let's say there weren't the others. Let's say it's just a white round cold thing. Now I've taken out cold and I've just got the idea of something white and round. So it's more abstract than the idea of snowball. It contains fewer, um, uh, simple ideas. Um, so it matches more things than snowballs, like cotton balls, golf balls, and all kinds of other things, right? Um, but the thing that's weird about this is Then remember, he says, infants get simple ideas first. So, so like when an infant first perceives a snowball, let's say, they get the simple idea of what? Only later do they form complex ideas. And only later than that, they perform abstraction. And remember, he says certain non-human animals, um, so first of all, he says all non-human animals can't perform abstraction at all. And 
um, some of them compound, but only to a very limited extent, right? That's the whole thing about how the dog recognizes its master by smell and sight and, you know, um, but it doesn't get very far beyond that. So, um, so on this way of looking at it, it would seem like you start with the most abstract ideas of all, right? Like a simple idea, you take everything out except white, and you only have a simple idea left. And now it applies to everything white. <laughs> and right, so, um, so there seems to be a contradiction here, right? Like on the one hand, we said that infants get simple ideas first. And then on the other, and then we said that only after that can they compound. And then only after that can they abstract. But on the other hand, with the way we were looking at that abstraction, it looks like those simple ideas they got first were already abstract. And moreover, as I put it before, that, that abstraction didn't happen in the mind at all, if you call that abstraction. It happened in their sense organs, right? The separation of the qualities that were blended together in the snowball didn't happen in the mind. It happened between the snowball and the mind, right? Because I had one sense organ that's affected by certain characteristics of the snowball and another one that's affected by another characteristic of the snowball. Yeah. Could it be argued then that abstraction is active generalization? Well, um, it's so it is definitely, I mean, it is definitely active generalization. That is, um, in order to have general ideas, Locke says, we need they need they have to be abstract, right? So forming abstract ideas is generalization. So these abstract ideas are going to apply to many things, whereas the concrete, or sorry, it doesn't say concrete; it says particular. The particular ideas only apply to individuals. Um, yeah. So what I'm what I'm finding confusing is that if this is what abstraction is, then the simplest ideas are also the most abstract. That's what you would think, but I'm saying, but that doesn't it doesn't work. So this must there must be more to what abstraction is. Is what I'm leaving. There must up. be some like another step to it that we're that I'm not getting. And so let me read again the description of abstraction. To prevent this, or sorry, that's to prevent this connecting to the previous sentence. The mind that makes the particular ideas received from particular objects to become general, which is done by considering them as they are in the mind, such appearances separate from all other existences and the circumstances of real existence as time, place, or any other concomitant ideas. So what's really essential to abstraction is, as I said, this idea of existence that goes with every idea is always the idea of existence at a time. And as long as it's, a, it's idea of existence at an individual time, the idea is particular, no matter how simple it is. We can't separate that, but we can, through abstraction, giving general purpose to the ideas. Right. Mm -hmm. A baby can't and a non-human animal can't, but we can. So like if we go back and see what the baby actually can do, this is book one, chapter two, section 15 on page 65. Um, for a child knows as certainly before it can speak the difference between the ideas of sweet and bitter, that is, that sweet is not bitter, as it knows afterwards when it comes to speak 
that wormwood and sugar plums are not the same thing. Right, so what it learns after it comes to speak, and again, Locke is gonna say that abstraction is the necessary condition for learning language. So after it becomes able to abstract and therefore able to speak, it will know that wormwood and sugar plums are not the same thing, that is not the same kind of thing. What does it know when it's still an infant and it can't speak? Not that white and not that uh, sweet and bitter are different in general, but that the sweet is not the bitter. <laughs> I think is what this means, right? Um, that is the sweet thing is not. Uh, oops, no, it's. I don't know. They must make a camera. Oh, Enoch has raised his hand. He must make a camera with a USB C connector. Um, can I ask my question or? Or ask your question while I try to figure out how to get the video. Well, about that weird consequence of Locke's view on abstraction, I had. I had a slightly, I don't know if my reading is correct, but I have like two slightly different readings of this. Okay. <laughs> One is like, instead of thinking of, okay. yeah, instead of, so I have two readings separately, right? I mean, they're kind of related. So one is, instead of reading this process as a linear one or the relationship between complex and uh, abstract as some sort of like linear one, what about we, we, we if we think of it in terms of like a true two by two um, matrix, right? And then like simple and complex are like the columns and the rows are uh, particular and abstract. And so you could have like yeah. yeah so what I was saying was trying to explain. I I agree that what I was trying to trying to explain how that can be. Right, because on the original way of looking at abstraction, it looked like abstraction and simplicity would be the same thing. So they couldn't be two different dimensions. So oh, yeah, sorry. I'm trying to explain how there can be particular simple ideas, and that's what the infant has first, particular simple ideas. And then later it makes particular compound ideas. Right. And then only later, does it make, start to make abstract ideas? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So I guess, I guess you were going to introduce. Yeah. So, no, so in other words, I think we're I think we're in agreement. Okay. <laughs> oh, I don't know. All yeah, right. Yeah, I thought I had a wrong week. Yeah. Um, okay, so again, there's more to say about that, but... So I'm obviously not going to say very much about space today, but I do want to at least talk about the classification of complex ideas and explain where space fits into that. We'll see how far I get with that. Um, so I'm going to erase all of those. Okay, so now, so so we know there's two there's two types of ideas. There's simple ideas and there's this is ideas. And simple ideas and there's complex ideas. And complex ideas are divided into three types. Modes, ideas of substance, and relations. Relations are actually, I mean, it, it seems like you might want to have relations kind of branch off before this. They're pretty different from both of these. But anyway, this is the way Locke puts it. Um, so these are all complex ideas. What's the difference between them? Well, again, so in a relation, you know, Locke says the, the mind goes beyond the idea to look towards another one or something like that. So, I mean, We'll see more about that when we get to the chapter on relations. But what's the difference between these two? So in these two cases, we in both cases, we have like a, a kind of 
list of properties, right? Um, but the difference is that um, in, I mean, there's a number of different ways of looking at the difference, but I guess the simplest way is to say the difference is that in this case, the idea is the idea of something that has all those properties. Whereas in this case, the idea is just the idea of all those properties that something could have. So this is related to the metaphysical terminology of substance and accident or substance and modes. Um, uh, but I don't think it's important to connect it to that, at least just yet. I mean, the difference between the ideas is that this idea is the idea of something that has all those properties. So, like in so in theory, you could have two ideas with the same list of properties, and one of them is a mode, and the other is the idea of a substance. Right? Like the idea of snowballness, so to speak, would be a mode. <laughs> Whereas the idea of snowball would be a substance. But in fact, although Locke never really clearly explains this, I think he thinks we, we use these two different ideas, types of complex ideas for different purposes. And so basically, like, this is useful for representing things that we think actually exist. Right, so in other words, this isn't supposed to be an arbitrary list of properties that we put together. It's supposed to be a list of properties we put together because something has all those properties. Right, so the examples of ideas of substance are usually gonna be like natural things like horses and snowballs and whatever. Snowball, I guess a snowball is artificial, I don't know. Anyway, um, whereas this is mostly useful well, I mean, there's two contexts in which it's useful. One is mathematics, and that's the one that today's reading was about, um, uh, where we want to talk about um, the relationship between properties things can have without worrying about what the things are, basically. And the other is ethics, where we want to talk about properties that something should have, even though maybe it doesn't. And you'll see that most of the examples of so-called simple modes are mathematical examples like triangle and uh, furlong and whatever. And most of the examples of complex modes are things that are somehow uh, morally relevant, like theft is one example he uses several times, uh, drunkenness, uh, uh, but a lot of other things like that. Um, and, you know, he's, he actually later on is going to prove that, or prove, I don't know. Anyway, he's going he's gonna to give a certain example of where, when people had complex ideas in their mind, com, uh, mixed modes in their mind before anything had ever shown those properties together. And he says, at the first institution of society, people must have had many ideas of things that they had never seen, right? Like, in other words, in order to form a commonwealth, you had to first get the idea of a commonwealth, even though there had never been one. And then you could go ahead to set it up. And, you know, I mean, you could say something simpler about, sim similar about artificial things like tables and whatever. I, I don't think he talks about that anywhere. And it's a little weird because they seem like substance, ideas of substance. But anyway, so um, so that's the difference in these two different types of ideas, of these different two types of complex ideas. And then this one gets further divided into simple modes and mixed modes. And this really does seem to be a case where Locke made a poor choice of terminology. 
I don't know what else to say, but because this is very confusing, right? Because a simple mode is not a simple idea. A simple mode is a complex idea, <laughs> right? So simple is being used in two different senses here in the same classification. And like I said, that's confusing. It seems like you could have thought of some other way, like pure modes maybe. I mean, simple isn't even the opposite of mixed really, <laughs> right? Uh, but anyway, we, we, it's too late to change this terminology. We're, we're stuck with it. So, right. So there's simple modes and mixed modes. In, in mixed modes, the different ideas you put together to make the complex idea are all different from each other. In simple modes, and this is harder to understand, somehow the same simple idea is put together with itself. So you mentioned numerical variation, like one, two. Right. So number is an example of a simple mode. And it's probably the easiest one to understand. Um, but do I have time to say anything about it? Well, I'll, so I'll just say, so like, it seems like in, in all these cases, we represent the object as bigger by having a bigger idea. <laughs> and in particular, we represent two by having an idea that contains unity and then contains unity again. <laughs> now, like where these things are, because they're not in space, they're in, a, they're in idea space, you know, but what does that mean? What is this dimension in which they're next to each other um, is maybe hard to understand. I mean, they're not by unity again. Well, yes, right. So exactly, there's, there's another unity that applies to the whole thing. But I mean, like that's kind of the result we want. Right, I mean, this explains how, even though Locke doesn't go into detail, but I think this is the way he understands it. How can we represent really huge numbers like a million? Not by adding a unity to itself a million times. We have to take some bigger number as the unit, right? And that's, we can do that because it is a unit. <laughs> um, all right. So that's relatively easy to understand in the case of number, although there's various puzzles about it. But I'll say, leave you with this question. What about the case of space? What is the simple idea that we repeat? <laughs> because Locke doesn't think we have an idea of the smallest possible space. He says that explicitly in this room. So it's not that. <laughs> okay, on that note, See you next time.